Hello everyone and welcome back to day 40, uh, 45 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So in the last couple of um, in the last couple of sessions, we've been sort of gradually, uh, I guess, warming up with some Python stuff, uh, doing some um, some kind of toy DSLs and Python, kind of demoing some of the ideas that we will uh, build on for. Um, for our hardware description language, uh, Rattle, which uh, I plan to start beginning uh, beginning today, at least some some more uh, serious work on. So the the other stuff we did, uh, those ideas re will recur, but uh, we're basically going to start with a clean slate today. Um, this, you know, kind of having some some more serious end goal in mind. Um, so that's basically the plan. Uh, I should also just quickly mention this weekend I did some casual streams on uh, on the Twitch channel, um, where I just uh, just to get used to Python again after having not used it uh, on a daily basis for a while um, with with all the other systems programming low level stuff. I did a bunch of just like random advent of code uh, puzzles, and uh, I don't think I'm going to upload those to the YouTube uh, channel because it's not really high quality content it was more just like a hangout stream of me doing random stuff but um in case you see this and uh while the archives are still up you can go check it out um, and depending on feedback i may upload it to youtube as well but don't think it was particularly interesting but um, in case people are craving content uh there is i think two times three hours worth of, of that this weekend all right um so, so um so let me just, uh, I guess, quickly uh, remind you of what we had here, um, and I'll, I'll mention how sort of the real version or whatever of this uh, will, will differ in a couple of ways. Um, so um, the, the the big thing in the DSL we sketched out um, for doing kind of basic logic is uh, it was bit oriented. The, it only really had um, you know, single bits as the data type. So that's one limitation. Um, another one is it doesn't really have any abstraction facilities. So uh, the language itself, um, we had an example, uh, I think at the end of last stream where I, I showed how you could, you know, despite the fact that you don't have support for bit vectors or, uh, or other kind of language level abstraction facilities, how you could kind of exploit the host languages uh, features uh, host language being Python in this case, to basically still get the job done um, with with this kind of primitive object language, and um, and we had this adder where you can specify the bit width and it synthesizes a bunch of individual bits and uh, does synthesizes all the logic um, to make it so to to generate an adder, and um, that's great and indeed the fact that you can do this kind of stuff is one of the reasons why uh, using a powerful host language like Python is a good idea. Um, but still, you want to um, you want the language, the the object language, as I'm calling it. Uh, this is kind of standard terminology when you have this kind of setup. People usually talk about the the meta language or the host language, and the object language is sort of the the underlying thing, which in this case is just our simple node language, uh, which is bit oriented. Uh, but you want that like you want that object language to be more uh, fully featured than this. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So one of them is that um, I'll, I'll mention a couple of reasons. Even if a lot of these features could be packaged up in a fairly neat way, just using Python features um, without adding them really to the object language per se. Uh, in other words, it's it would be sort of as if all these higher level features would be implemented almost like macro with macro expansion rather than as true language features. Uh, even though that that is possible to a very large extent. Um, you lose a lot by doing so, and uh, I'll, I'll mention two two things that are pretty substantially relevant. Um, one of them is that we will ultimately be um, generating Verilog code, and uh, we want the Verilog code. Uh, Verilog is a an HDL. Uh, I'll talk more about it later. But in any case, we're targeting a Verilog uh, language subset um, for one of the backends for our uh, language here. And, uh, you know, in a similar way that we targeted C for ION, basically. Um, and uh, while, you know, we can't make the Verilog code we generate kind of fully reflect, um, you know, our intention in the source, in the source language, 
much like with our ion code and our, our generated C code from that, we want there to be some resemblance b between the two languages. Like we want certain idioms and intentions of the programmer to carry through in the translation. And, uh, and if the source language completely has no notion of, for example, bit vectors or higher level data types uh, and operators that act on those higher level data types and everything has to be expressed at the bit level, then the Verilog code will be completely um, Will, will be completely non-idiomatic and kind of explosive because everything, you know, so like if you're working with, for example, with a 32-bit vector, uh, everything will just have to be exploded into uh, 32 copies of everything and so on. It will be a complete mess. So, so that's one reason. It's very hard to um, express things idiomatically while keeping things at the bit level like that. Um, even though when you're talking about actual hardware in the end, all that stuff, of course, you're dealing with a single wire at a time that represents a voltage, which, which in, you know, in a well-defined state corresponds to a zero or one. So there's a sense in which the hardware itself is bit-oriented, but you don't want to uh, force everything to be bit level until quite late in that pipeline. So that's one reason if you're targeting something like Verilog, you don't want to prematurely um, kind of lose information about, you know, the data types and stuff like that. The other one has to do with simulation speed. Um, one of the nice things about keeping things as bit vectors is that you can use your CPU's features for bit, for bit vector math um, to really speed things up dramatically. So for example, if you're doing a bitwise AND of two bit vectors, um, you can, ex you can compile that to, or ultimately execute that on your CPU as if you know, you're doing a bitwise AND of, of registers or whatever, of, of whatever your native uh, processor word width is. Um, and depending on the bit vector size relative to your native word size in, um, in your CPU, you, know, you may have to um, you know, do more than one, say, bitwise AND uh, in order to simulate a bit vector AND at the source language level, but nevertheless, you can get some serious leverage there. And so that you, from that, you can easily get a factor of, say, 32 or 64 um, in simulation speed for those bitwise operations. So that's another thing, that keeping things kind of higher level in the source language um, means that you can do faster simulation generally. You have more information about how to map things efficiently. So uh, those are just a couple of reasons. Um, and, and I mean, the other, the other reason is that even though you could, in theory, probably you know, a lot of these features like what I'm doing here, you probably couldn't, in theory, wrap them up in a way where they look pretty nice to the programmer to use once they've been built. Um, it's probably hard to go all the way there uh, in terms of convenience compared to a sort of first-class language feature for, say, bit vectors or other higher-level data types other than just bits. So um, those are just a few random reasons why you do want the sort of language to be more expressive than what we have here. Um, and another thing, this is not really hard coded into the language, but it's kind of implicit, is that um, the language we have right now is kind of expression oriented, for lack of a better word. Like it's very much about, uh, and, and that's mostly a good thing. Um, you know, like you, you take other nodes and you combine them like expressions and that builds a new node that has things hooked up in a certain way to compute an output and so on. And you can, you can do that recursively with, uh, you know, nesting sub expressions and whatnot. Um, and that's great and all, but sometimes, uh, you want to be able to, to do things a little bit differently where, especially once you end up having more complex circuits and you need to have feedback loops and stuff like that. Um, it's convenient if um, you still want to allow this expression-oriented style of just kind of combining uh, results to produce new results. Um, but you also want something that's more like, you know, a circuit where you can take two, you, you can start with two components that don't have their pins connected, and then you can say, okay, connect this pin to that pin. Um, so kind of more like a... Uh, you know, more like how you would, you would take a bunch of components in a circuit and hook them up uh, piecemeal rather than always have to express things in this expression style. So you want to allow at least for that, even if the expression style of combination is still available, uh, you, you want to allow for that. Um, and that's something we don't currently support. So all these reasons are, uh, there's a couple of reasons why um, we maybe want to take a slightly more general approach to, to some of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> Another big thing in terms of a sort of a missing language feature we want to put in as a first class feature is um, what in Verilog is called a module. And I guess in VHDL it's called, what do they call it? Architecture and entity or something like that, which is basically an interface and an implementation. Um, 
in their terminology. It's a little bit weird terminology in VHDL for all kinds of things. But basically, it's the idea of having a reusable template, much like a class in an instance. So you can describe, for example, an adder uh, as a as sort of an archetype, an, a, a, a template. Um, and then it can be instantiated, uh, you know, in different instances. Um, and um, and each of those instances have the same basic structure, but they have, you know, they have different connectivity to, to other nodes. Um, and th so that's kind of, you know, what we were uh, what we were doing here, where the function itself on demands makes an, uh, essentially an instance of something. But we want to have this as more as a, as a first class feature. You'll still be able to do things like this, but uh, you want to have some notion of a module or a component where you can define the, you know, the template as it were once and for all and say, these are the inputs and these are the outputs. And here's the, the logic that relates the inputs to the outputs. Um, and sort of be able then to instantiate it differently. And again, one reason you want to do that, it's not just so that it's a useful feature. It's also that if you look at something like Verilog, that's how an AVHDL, that's how they structure things. Um, and so being able to target that more, mostly one-to-one -one, uh, means you can generate more idiomatic Verilog code on the back end. So anyway, those were a bunch of features um, that we want to support. So um, let's just see here. All right, let me think of where we want to start compared to last time or with the, the original experiment. Um, we probably end up having something much like this in the end. Um, Right, we probably do want, you know, we, 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 we do end up wanting some way to mix in these operator overloads. Um, and so all that stuff is great. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's probably fine. Um, let me think of where, where to start this. Um, let, let me sketch out the kind of thing you want to be able to write. So just kind of writing the use case before the implementation. So this is for modules. And there may be some differences in exactly uh, whether we use a decorator or a meta class or a super class or whatever in order to sort of mix in that functionality that creates a module uh, template. But um, this is the kind of thing that you might... Okay, thanks for that autocomplete. Um, this is the kind of thing you would... You, I. I I uh, want to be able to write. Um, I mean, again, kind of a simple example, but um, if you, suppose you wanted to write um, a, a module instance, um, and uh, I don't know, say say this is a byte adder, um, so it has two, uh, so it has two inputs, and you want to be able to say something like this. Um, Maybe I'll write them just like this. And then, you know, maybe write it like that, or you just write it like, like that. Uh, maybe this is left and right, and this is out. Yeah, it's called in one, in two. Um, and so, uh, Forgetting about this for a moment, what this says is there is uh, the the first input is a bit vector of uh, of width eight, as is the second input. Then there is a, uh, a a single output which is a bit vector of width eight as well. Uh, and for now, of course, we haven't really specified uh, how any any how anything is connected. Um, and so um, um, so so far, this is really just an interface. Um, but then you can you know, you can write uh, you can write code here to define the output, and um, you know you could do this in a variety of ways. But uh, if you mimic, suppose we wanted to do something roughly like the adder we had before, uh, you might do something like this. Um, um, well. Let's see what are different ways we could do it. Um, I mean, you certainly could do a lot of what we did there. Um, yeah, we, we can do this. Um, we can so we can do it like that, and then you could do um, 
to do basically the same thing, I guess. Uh, full adder n1 into c, and that's more or less it. Um, and the interpretation of this is, you know, as I said, here are the inputs and outputs, and these are the types of those. Uh, here, this just represents a, you know, this just represents. It's not really a local variable, but it kind of is. It's a variable that exists in the scope of, uh, of, of this class definition. And keep in mind, these are not like instance variables. Uh, when you, uh, in Python, when you have stuff here, you know, normally you, you, you can do things like this, but here we're basically just defining them as class level variables. And, um, and that's basically it. And the, and the way this will work, incidentally, is this will execute as a body with a local scope, and these will be added to that scope. And then the class is constructed based on, on that dictionary. Um, uh, that defines all these different variables, and uh, and then the class is created, and we want to somehow intercede either prior to construction or after construction in order to reinterpret all of those things as defining a module uh, in our circuit language. So, uh, but anyway, what this means is essentially, uh, you know, at, at the point we define the output here, the output has not really been hooked up. We've just specified what it is, so we know how wide it is and so on. Um, in order for this to be a well-formed module definition, you basically need you need all the outputs to be properly connected to something that drives them. Um, I mean, you could have a convention that any undriven bits are a zero or whatever, but uh, in general, you would want everything to be explicitly defined. And so, in this case, um, each of these assignments essentially drives one uh, each of the eight bits of that output um, with you know one of the results of the full adder. And as as in the previous example from from the last session. Uh, the other part of this is the carry, which is just kind of chained throughout this uh, throughout this addition, but uh, ultimately uh, only it sort of serves as a uh, some temp you can think of it as temporary state or whatever throughout the addition. It doesn't ultimately get output by itself. We could have a, a final you know C out a single bit uh, C out um, like that, but um, uh, let's say we don't do that. So that would be the kind of thing you can do. Um, and then suppose I wanted to do a um, uh, suppose you wanted to then kind of use this module in defining another module. Suppose you wanted to do a word adder, or maybe you'll do a half you'll do a half word adder. Um, uh, let me just call it eight. Uh, so it's a little more. Um, and so suppose now you have a sixteen bit adder. And you wanted to define it in terms of, of of this thing here as a primitive piece, um, because this is where you know the whole notion of reuse comes in, and we can define this. This is a template, and we can instantiate it uh, as many times as we want in different contexts with different kinds of connectivity. And so um, you would do something like this, um, um, and you can use either positional. You know, just like with Python itself, you can use either positional arguments or named arguments, um, and um, you know that's basically fine. Like you, you can use whatever makes sense. For some of these things that are very that have only a few inputs, um, you might use them positionally without too much chance of confusion. But definitely, when when it gets more, uh, when you have more inputs and stuff, and, and it's unclear what order they occur in, maybe you want to use named arguments. So let's just use named arguments uh, to make it very explicit and to, and to showcase that. So you would be able to do this, and you would say the uh, the in one of this adder eight. So these are the lower eight bits of uh, you want to add. Um, we will take the um, we will use bit slicing. So again, this is a feature we will want to have explicitly in our language, where we can you know we have bit vectors and you can do bit slicing like they are you know, containers basically. Um, and so we want to be able to do this, and we want to say, you know, these are where the the inputs are, and and to drive the output, we will specify that again, we want to um, the the result of this uh, of this eight bit adders uh, should be driven to. Oh, sorry, this is wrong. I meant eight, of course. 
this would be driven to the lower half of that output bit vector and then um, for the uh, for the upper half so here we have a dilemma incidentally and and probably why um, we're going to go back and add uh, um, Yeah, let, let's do it like that. So, um, so I said I wasn't going to do this, but uh, yeah, I just realized we, we actually need it when we're uh, building these bigger adders from smaller adders. So um, we're going to have a carry in, so that's a single bit input, and then there's going to be a carry out in addition to um, the main out. And um, so the uh, the initial carry is initialized from this, and that gets changed throughout. And then when we're done, uh, we create an output, and we create it from the final uh, the final carry of that uh, eight bit carry sequence and um, one thing here and and you know we may differ a little bit on the syntax is that um, if you have a an expression so c here is like a circuit expression or something like that um, you can do basically type inference on the output if you want so um, rather than saying this is a eight bit vector and here is what drives that uh, pin you could just say hey there's an output it's called you know it's c out and it's driven by C, and it can infer the bit width and stuff like that from just from the expression driving it. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, and sometimes you want to separate the interface from the implementation a bit more, but I just wanted to show that you can do this too. Um, all right. Let's do something like that. Um, all right. Um, and so yeah. So and then in order to to do uh, to do this here. We're going to um, we're going to have the same sort of deal. Um, and here I'm going to do it like that, specified up here. I think that's going to be more convenient. And so in this case, um, you know, the carry in of the low part comes out there. Um, um, so yeah, this may be a good example of how. Doing everything in a data flow expression oriented style is not always so sufficient. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up I'm going to hook up the um, the C in and the out, but I'm not going to hook up the the C um, the C out directly. I'm not going to write C out whatever here at this level. Uh, instead I'm going to do it here. So um, So you can you can hook up outputs directly at this level um, when instantiating the module, but you can also kind of do it later, right? It's like a fan out; you can depend on it later. Um, and so, so sorry for this. Um, we're going to do the uh, the upper eight bits, and for the C in now we want to have the C out of the adder below it, like the lower half adder. So that's something you can do. Um, as well. Um, and here we we do want well. You could you could do this in order to connect it up like that. You could also, if you wanted to sort of mimic the style we used in the other uh, in the eight bit adder, you could also do something like this if you wanted to. Um, either way, but I think this here is probably better. Um, but yeah, so note that basically what you're doing here is you're not choosing everything that's connected to the output of adder one at the instantiation time. Later, in this case, just in the very next line, you can hook up uh, one of its outputs to the input of another module instance. So this is pretty typical. And this is the kind of thing where, like I said, doing everything in an expression-oriented style is not always great. You want to be able to treat it more like, you know, like, you know, take a bunch of things and then hook them up piecemeal. Um, uh, you can sometimes do without it, but it's nice to be able to do it when when it, when it uh, feels more natural. So yeah, so that's one thing you can do. And then of course you could, if you wanted to, here I'm doing it manually, you could write a function to do all this instantiation for you. But like, you know, if you wanted to do, to, uh, to continue uh, th this divide and conquer pattern for instantiation, you could uh, do it like this. Uh, but anyway. 
so that's that, that's one of the that's the basic idea behind modules. Um, I should mention that um, Python recently in a what version was it? Um, uh, 3.5, three six order dictionaries. Yeah, they did it in, in three six. So um, they added something that started out as an implementation detail for uh, Python dictionaries, where uh, I think it, it was guaranteed for starting from 3.6 in, in, in class dictionaries, but not in all dictionaries and, and all sets. But basically, uh, they, Guido came out and said it's now guaranteed for all, for all eternity. Um, but basically, Python dictionaries uh, now have this guaranteed feature starting in 3.6, where um, the insertion order is preserved if you iterate over it um, later. So if, if you have a dictionary and... I guess, you know, I guess let me show two cases. Um, this is what you make it into a list. Uh, so you can see that it preserved the insertion order order in this case. And I suppose I repeat it again with the reverse insertion order. Um, it uh, preserves the insertion order. So you can see it's not related to the key or anything like that. Um, this is a very useful feature. It's not something in general that you get for hash tables. Keep in mind, all this stuff is backed by hash tables under the hood. But because of the hash table representation they use, it actually preserves insertion order. And one really nice feature about that is, um, in particular, in class dictionaries like these, um, the order that you're uh, initializing these fields is actually preserved uh, when you traverse the class, class dictionary later, say, when the class is constructed. And so it's very convenient because like if you want to preserve, like when you're translating this to Verilog or some other target language, if you want to preserve the original order, um, you can do that because you get that for free, basically. Um, and so this is a new feature in 3.6. Um, it was originally, at least in most of the case uses of, of dictionaries, I think was just sort of an implementation detail that wasn't guaranteed to be true in, for, for future versions. Um, but now I think Guido came out and said that it is indeed guaranteed. So um, you can, we're actually going to be using this for lots of, of other things. Like, for example, um, um, what's an example of syntactic sugar? Suppose we want to have some kind of case. I'm just going to show this. Suppose you want to have some kind of case, uh, case expression. Um, I don't know. Um, you can actually do, I mean, you can do stuff like this. I don't know. I mean, in, in this case, it doesn't really matter much because there's no, you know, there's no side effects or there's no priority uh, between the different cases. Um, but the, the, the point is, if you have a dictionary like this now, you want to use it for some syntactic sugar, like some kind of whatever uh, that you want to do, then uh, you can actually rely on the dictionaries, you know, the order in which it's written as a literal is going to be the order it's uh, found in when you iterate over it later. Uh, and so it lets you use it for lots of stuff. The same is also true for sets, by the way. So if you have a, a set constructor like this, um, you, you actually know that when you iterate over it now and in, in 3.6 and later, the order is going to be respected. And so you can, you can use a lot of the stuff for syntactic sugar if you want to. And we're going to be doing that in a few cases. All right. Um, Anyway, so this is the sort of thing we want to support. Um, so let's see, where do we want to start? Where do we want to start? Um, all right, so that was just some illustration. Um, sorry, let me just think about what the uh, right place to start is. Um, all 
Uh, okay, let's let's start with something that's pretty close to what we had before, but now with some kind of type checking, basically. Um, and so we'll still have um, we'll st we'll still have a, a class called node, and it's going to represent you know a node in some kind of circuit graph. Um, but now it has a type, um, and so uh, let's say that they all have types of some sort, um, and um, there's there's a question of um, so so one thing to note is that you know previously we had these binary operators and unary operators that were kind of privileged like they were built in in some way and they had their own special kind of node um, once you start having modules um, uh, you know as a first class thing in the language you can actually start treating if you want to, and I'm not sure we'll do that right from the get-go just to get started because that would then kind of make everything contingent on having all the module features working from, from, from day zero, which I may not want to. But basically, all this stuff, like all this binary node uh, and unary node stuff we did previously, you can actually treat that as a special, just like as a special case of whatever general module instance thing. So you can treat, you know, you can treat, um, for example, you know, if you want to do the equivalent of of uh, you know of, of something like this, uh, you, you can treat this basically in the context of a module. You can treat this as like um, you know suppose and is a a module like corresponds to a module. You you can basically just do this. Um, you could do something like that. Um, so, so, so the point is, uh, you don't necessarily have to treat those operators as being built in. Um, like you can just treat them as module uh, modules that are built in, but you don't have to treat them at the sort of syntax tree level as as having special status. But we may do so just to get started. All right. Um, so let's see here. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll start. Uh, we'll start as before with this stuff. Um, let's see. What do we want to start with? Um, So, um, so let's say we have one type, which I'll call bit, and um, and then we have another type, which is bit vector, and um, you're not supposed to really use these classes directly. There will be some constructor functions to um, to help with that. Um, so basically there's going to be uh there's going to be you know one thing called bit here and there's going to be another thing called uh maybe that should be um like a constructor function of some sort um i think you probably want to memorize Maybe we should do a memorizer. Um, um. I remember it's a little bit more awkward to do memorization when you have keyword arguments. Maybe let's just not allow that for a sec. Um, something like that. So this is just a decorator. It takes a, a function to decorate. Um, 
and it returns a closure. It closes over the table. Um, you could also do it without that if you wanted to make it an attribute of memo f itself or whatever. But um, you can rewrite that later if we need to. Um, so you know, it's it's a typical memorization decorator that uh, when you call it, it checks to see it checks to see if it already has computed that value. Um, and uh, if it hasn't, then it computes it for the first time and puts it in the table. Otherwise, it would. Oh. So let's try this. Um, I think it's key error, right? Um, I think something like this works. Um, and then you will memorize this. And uh, I think this basically returns a bit vector of that length. Something like that. Um, this thing here, really all we care about is having a unique thing we can compare on. Um, but the reason I'm going to intern this is much like, um, if you recall back in the, the type system and the ion compiler, um, it's nice to be able to check for type equivalence by just doing pointer equality so by by doing as long as we construct everything through uh, all bit vectors through this uh constructor um and basically i guess i can show you already uh, let's see here um well first off you know this is self-evidently true um but also if i do if I do this, this should be true if the memorizer works. Okay, we haven't. So this is true. However, um, if I if I were to directly call, you know, to call this twice, that would be false because each of them is a unique instance. So the purpose of this kind of front end is to um, is to kind of uniquify. Uh, different instances of those types. Um, so I don't know if this is, yeah, so I mean, so show you some, some syntactic sugar tricks. Um, what is it? Uh, I'm trying to remember what. What is that magic method called that I'm thinking of? Get item. Sorry, that's what it's called. Um, and so, if you wanted to do something like um, like you could do this, um, which then means you can do like, for example. Call this, it's the same as calling this, assuming I did my job correctly here. Right. So, this is just syntactic sugar where, um, you know, if you use this bracket notation on the bit type, much like, you know, you could write something like this in some languages, you can write this. And so, uh, it's just syntactic sugar, but the kind of thing that's easy to do. Uh, and this will also be memorized because even though the method itself is not memorized, it calls a function that is memorized. So that's why this thing comes out true when we use is for pointer equality. All right. Um, so those are the, um, that's, uh, that's it for those types. So that's the kind of thing you can plug into a node. Um, now, um, suppose we, uh, and we wanted to find some of these bitwise operators. And um, so, so what do we do here? Um, well, one thing is we will, um, the way the type checking is going to work is um, the type checking uh, is going to sort of happen immediately when you instantiate nodes. 
So it's not like we're going to construct, you know, the whole syntax graph um, and um, and then eventually do a sort of a full graph pass to compute type information and, and check that it's consistent. Uh, as soon as something is connected to something, we're basically going to check validity um, of that combination. So in this case, for example, um, you could do like if self type is not equal to self other uh, race type error. Can't remember if you could use this with a default argument. Let me just try that. Okay, you can. Um, but it should probably, maybe you can have a helper for that. Check, same type. Left, right. Um, let's not do an error for now um let's just at least we have it in one space so we can add it later i don't know what the right thing to say there is um so check that um check same type um and then you construct a new node and for for now i'm just going to use the same thing as before basically um and the um, and I guess you could even do that in the binary node itself. That's probably actually the right place to do it now that I think about it. Um, And we can call the super class to initialize the type, and we're just going to use the left the left type because we've verified that the left and right types are the same. Um, and then we do this. Oh, the op. Um, Um, maybe you can do this. Yeah, let's do that. Um, of course, we could do that for all the other operators, but uh, let's just take the minimum for now but we want something similar to the uh, as node thing we had before um, and so if we already have an instance of node then we just return that um, uh, um, else and then we had you know if, if something is a number then we um we treat it as a constant so that's another thing we have to do we have to have constants um and uh 
when we so so now previously constants were just booleans but now they can be um i guess there's a question of you know a constant bit versus a constant bit vector uh, for now let's just keep them as the same kind of node um and so we do something like this um Just check something here. I think there's this is something they changed in Python three. Python used to have a distinction between ints and longs, which was basically you know like built-in integers and big nums. So that doesn't exist anymore. So we don't have to do anything for long. Um, so um, maybe I'll, I'll do it like this. I'll say. Yeah, let's do it like that for now. So even if it's a bool, we convert it to an int at this point. Um, and then if we have an int, oh yeah. So here's the other thing. Um, And I'll have to think about how good of an idea this is, but it but it seems like in a lot of these cases where you're converting one of the operands to the other, uh, you should promote the constant to the right type based on the context. And I don't know how good an idea that is, but uh, I tried that previously and it seemed to work out. Uh, and so you can specify kind of no guided type, in which case it's fully inferred just from the constant. Um, but um, and by the way, I think Python has, what is it? Um, it has this thing, which might be useful in that context. If you have absolutely no notion of what the context expects from a constant and how, how wide to treat it, um, you can you can just compute the bit length like that, which I guess just does a log two, ceiling of log two or something like that under the hood. Um, Um, so yeah, you want to do constant cell or a constant type x, um, and you say if type is none, then type is bit of, um, you want to have at least one, so it does this thing which you, don't think you want where if you do this you get zero um, but we never want to have a bit width of zero so it's always at least one um, so this should be max it's either it's at least one and then it's um, the bit length otherwise we use the um, the type that's uh, that comes in here Um, all right, um, let's, um, I guess you can call this cast. Or something like that. Um, let's define a method on types that, that is called cast, where it takes a value, and this will be a constant value, um, and c conforms it to that type. And so uh, this is what it will be in this case for a single bit. Um, we did something like that previously, but I'm not going to cast it to bool. It's always going to be an int. So it's going to be a one-bit int. Um, and for uh, for this, it's going to be the usual bitwise stuff. Um, yeah, okay. The presidents is off. Okay. Um, 
So, you know, if you take, for example, I don't know, 300 and you end it with this, you get something between 0 and 255 inclusive. That's modulo 256, basically. Um, so that's really all that does. We do the same thing here. And so, um, let's just do some functions that we can print it easily. Um, let's see. So, um, we print the value and then we print the representation of the type with a colon here. I mean, we, I guess we could also use something more like Python constructor notation, which is, I think is probably more in the spirit of that um, self type, self value. Um, so for bit vectors, just gonna do that. Um, Okay. Should be eight bits. If I um, if I specify What is it? If I if I specify like sixteen here, that should be used instead of the inferred type. Right. Alright. Um Okay, binary nodes. All right, so this covers more or less what we had there. Um, let's just fill in at least the reverse one. So in this case, um, we want to do it like in the reverse order. Okay. Um, 
Okay, then we have input nodes and um, input nodes have names. Guess let's put the type first. Let's be consistent. Um, and they have names. Um, and so this is where, like in a module or even outside a module with a freestanding input node, you would do something like, I don't know. Could do something like this. Um, and I'm going to show you a trick in a second. A lot of these things are not really kind of deep, not really about hardware, not really about anything. It's just like random tricks for doing um, for doing embedded DSLs in Python. But um, and actually, this trick I learned from MyGen, which is a another Python HDL. Um, I don't think we technically need it here because most cases our inputs will occur in a class dictionary context where we can just fill it in that way. Um, but um, yes, maybe I'll show that first and then I'll show the, the low level trick after. But basically, in a case like this, it's very annoying to have to specify um, the name at construction time, right? Because um, it's kind of duplicating what's already on the left hand side, but there's no, I mean, you don't know what thing you're assigned to when you're constructing an object. Like at the time when the object is constructed, the assignment hasn't even taken place. But there are cases where you can infer it and uh, let you just write this, and it fills in the name correctly as left, this is the string left. So that's the kind of thing we want to be able to do. Um, and so there's th this. This is the thing, and then there's a. Um, uh, so that's why I'll let this be none, because in many cases we want it to be inferred from the context, and so in this case. Um, we create an input node and uh, you know it just has these things as types it's just a simple constructor function for now um, and all right maybe that's it um, let's um, see if I remember what that thing is called this is a feature that's new Python 3.6 as well as a new subclass or init subclass. This is something I think you used to have to do with meta classes, but they added this shortcut, which I think actually is sufficient for what we're doing. Um, you used to have to do this with metal cl uh, meta classes, which are not that complicated, even though they have a bad reputation and usually don't you don't need them for anything in Python. But um, yeah. Um, don't know if I actually need to call that since there's no super class in this case to worry about. But um, the idea now is suppose you do something like this. Um, let me just print out the keyword argument so I can, I can show you what happens. So in this case, um, the idea is when this class is constructed, so let me roughly walk you through what happens when this thing executes in Python. Um, it basically executes the body of the class definition in its own, with its own local dictionary. So it fills in a dictionary. So if I type, you know, like x equals 42, and so on, it fills in a dictionary with those definitions. And then once it execute, finishes executing all that code in that scope, it calls, it basically, it wants to create a, uh, it wants to create a class. And so it says, hey, I want to create a class. The name is adder. And here is the list of super classes. In this case, there's only one super class. In this case here, there's zero super classes. I guess there's one that's implicit, which is object. Um, and, uh, and that's about it. And then from that, from all those ingredients, it creates a new class. 
Um, and all it's doing here, and previously, like I said, you had to do this with meta classes, is uh, it, it will call this basically in order to initialize or to create that class, that subclass. So I think if we do this, we should get, uh, oh, we don't. Maybe maybe I do have to use a meta class for that. I thought that's let me go and read this. I mean we can just use a meta class as well. Or a decorator that reconstructs a class from the contents. That's fine by me as well. Oh okay. It's this sort of thing. Um I guess let me show it with meta classes. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Not that it's necessarily um, my seal. Can't remember the signature from you. Okay, you don't have to declare it. Um, don't you get what is it name? All right, yeah, name, um, class, name, bases, namespace, keyword arcs. Um, The namespace is just the module is not a sub. Right. Okay, let's do it the other way. Not not that I think this won't work. Um, module is not a subtype of type. I mean, that's certainly true. Oh, because it's a meta class, I guess it has to inherit from type. Okay, there we go. Makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, so one thing you could do is you can iterate over this. And for example, if you have like, I don't know, if you have something like this. Hmm. 
I mean, let, let me show you what I mean. Um, Not that you'd necessarily want to do this, of course, but um, if this is input node um, and value um, name is none, then you can say value dot name equals name. And then I guess if I do something like this, okay, we have to create the wrapper function so we can print this. Um, use that same notation. So anyway, um, that's entirely due to this. If I comment this out, you can see it's just going to have none as the name because it hasn't been, uh, haven't had its name initialized. So that's the sort of thing you can do if you wanted to do it with meta classes. Um, Um, the other thing you can do, which is basically what I did in a previous incarnation of of this, was to use a decorator instead, where you have an initial class that basically just serves as a, purely as a namespace for the initial construction, and then it actually creates a new class um, by by looking at those class variables. So let me uh, let me show you that instead. So you would do it like this, and then you would have a class decorator. Um, And um, I guess you would call it like module class. It's going to be module class is going to be the final thing uh, that you define. Um, I guess you could also call type new directly if you wanted. Um, like yeah, you could totally do that. So you could. Uh, Um, So yeah, that's another way to do it, and that's what I did originally. But uh, I thought I would mention the other possibility, which has some advantages, but um, I think this looks cleaner. Uh, it has some pitfalls, but um, basically what this, so, so like I said, the way this works is it creates the initial, much like with class decorators in general, um, or function dec, like for example, if you look at, um, if you look at how mem th this memo function decorator works, it takes an initial function definition, like in our case, we're using it for bits, and it replaces it by another function. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mutate the existing function in place or anything like that. It creates a new function that wraps the old function, and then that becomes the new, the new binding, basically. So after um, 
without the you know after this decorator has ex like if you don't know the, this is equivalent this is equivalent to this um, that's what the decorator does it basically just it, it rebinds uh, it rebinds that name by calling the decorator on the result of the existing binding that's how decorators work and so in the case of this class decorator this is equivalent this is equivalent to writing this it should have the same result um all right um so yeah that's the sort of thing you could do and you know you could have have more than one of course and they you can see they both fill in the names um, so that is number one and actually um, I just remembered uh, one thing we want to do is all nodes have an optional name um, Let's make it so that then we don't even have to do anything here. So this just becomes a subtype. Um, um, make sure it still executes. So one reason for that is you want to be able to do stuff like this, where um, suppose Suppose I have some temporary result here, like, um, I don't know, something like this. Um, I actually want this to execute on everything. So basically, if any time you see a node, a, a name bound to a node, and that node doesn't already have a name, then it gets a name from that association. And so even in a case like this, um, That's a binary node. Um, self type, self left, self op, self right. Something like this. You can see here. Um, It's a little bit hard to read. I wonder if I should start suppressing the the types. Yeah, let, let me start. Let, 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 let me suppress the types in the representation. That's uh, a little bit too much of a good thing. Right. Um, you know, however, um, if I, I I can print the name of that one, so you can see it gets that just like just like the input nodes, um, this thing here gets the name from that association. All right, what are we doing on time? Still have three minutes left. All right, so what would be a next thing? So, th so this is just a very, the very basic. So all we're doing here basically is we're assigning names based on, uh, based on that uh, class namespace. Um, but we want to do more as well because actually, this class here doesn't look like it really has any super classes or really anything going on. But um, the new class we create is actually going to be like a factory for making module instances so that if I call adder, you know, with some arguments, that means create an instance, create a node, basically, um, create a module instance node, something like that.
Um, or, you know, create associations. Um, so let's see here. So that's probably going to be, we, we can just make that. Um, so when you call this, oh yeah, that's the other thing. Um, That's the other thing we want to do. We want to collect a list of the inputs and outputs. Um, let's make a copy up front. So far, it should just be the same old. All right, we have defined. Um, let's just make it like this for now. Um, now if you, um, This thing has gathered a list of input and output nodes. You can see there's two uh, inputs and zero outputs. Um, if I add this here, there should now be an output. Um, Um, 
Right, right, right. Okay, so, so far we still only really have the same old expression-oriented stuff we had before. Um, oh, another, yeah, right, right, another thing I should mention is uh, all right. So, so let me uh, b before we get to that, let's let's do the thing I mentioned where um, this thing mixes in a superclass, which has um, which you know serves two things. One is it identifies again as always. It, it serves as a tag, so we can identify modules easily. Um, but it's also going to have a constructor function, which um, um, creates a module instance. So we're going to have another thing called a, a module instance, and um, it's really just going to be a module and um, a set of inputs and outputs that have been maybe partially hooked up. So uh, for now, I'm not going to actually do anything with it other than just store it um, for validation. Um, so for now, we're just going to do this. But the result of calling this function, I guess, no, actually, this is, let's see, when we call this, um, no, I guess that actually does work. Actually, no, we don't need to separate that. We can just have that create instances of itself. So adder is a class, and instances are just normal class instances. So this thing here should basically validate. Um, for now, let's say we don't handle positional arguments. Let's just handle keyword arguments. It's not too hard to handle both, but um, let's just handle name base arguments. Um, so let's let's uh, iterate over these. At the point where this thing is called, uh, this stuff has already been initialized. Um, Um, I don't know if this is going to be, you know, the right, whatever, the right name, but um, that's what I'm going to call it. Connections, um, and uh, basically each of these arguments is going to create an association. Okay, sorry, no, this is, these should be dictionaries, not... Uh, This is how we do it. We associate the name um, and we validate that it's not uh, it's not there. Um, all right, and then if name and self inputs do one thing, 
uh, else if name in self outputs, do another thing. Um, for now, let's just do it like this. Um, we set up the association between the that thing and the value. And same thing here, but with the outputs. Okay. This emulator uh, or test case from earlier. So we're not going to hook anything up. We're just going to define the outputs and inputs here. Um, all right, let's just try plumbing it through. It's, it's not doing type checking right now, but that's obviously something it will do in a sec. Um, Okay, so that seemed to, to do something. If I now um, try to look at what the kind of thing this is. All right, so it has no printing functions. But anyway, that's an instance of that module. Um, Um, okay, let's do it like that. Um, okay, and then what is it? Check same type uh, node and value. That should actually fail. Oh no, it should fail now. <laughs> okay. Really? Hmm. 
node is in one. Okay, why do I assert I should raise? Okay, that's what I was looking for. Uh, and of course that's true because um, we're trying to plug in a 16-bit node into an 8-bit input. So that's no bueno. Um, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll, it'll be one minute and I'll be right back. And uh, the next thing we'll add is bit slicing in a way that changes the types accordingly so we can plug these things together. Be right back. All right, uh, I'll go for 20 more minutes, but I, w I want to add the bit slicing and make sure all this stuff type checks. So yeah, the, the problem right now is um, now that we're checking type conformity when we're instantiating modules, um, of course, uh, trying to plug in the 16-bit uh, thing into an 8-bit thing is, is, is raising an error as it should. Uh, so really what we want to write is this. We want to say the lower eight bits go there, the lower eight bits go there, and the lower eight bits go there. Um, and then the same for the upper, but let's just focus on that now. But of course, if we do that, we get an error saying we haven't, um, we can't subscript these nodes. So we have to, um, we have to go back to node and add some new operators. And um, let's see here. Um, where to start? I guess we could start by doing um, what do you want to call it? Uh, get item. So get item is, I can't remember if get item is also called when you do slicing or if it's only for a single index. So let's just uh, jog our memories. Right, you get, okay. So there's a couple of cases. Um, if the index is an integer, then you get, um, I don't know, let's call it just index node. And uh, so, we're, so we're going to create some new, some new node types for this. Um, then we get another thing. Um, All right, um, I, I can never quite remember uh, the structure of these slice objects, but uh, let's do the index one first, which I, I think we actually don't quite need um, for now. But um, 
let's just fill it in. So basically, you fill in a node. Um, And an index. Um, you don't. I guess you don't have to specify the type because it's fully inferred from uh, the node type. Um, Um, So for now, I'm not going to allow, you know, minus one style Python part, uh, indices, but um, I'll add those later. So uh, okay. And I don't know if this would be in the constructor or somewhere else. Normally, I don't like putting error checking code in the constructor, but uh, it's easy to move around later. So let's just uh, leave it here for now. Um, and um, for this stuff here, that's how it looks. So off brand. That index. And actually, this is not true. the The type is going to be bit, so the type is always going to be bit because if you slice a bit vector, you don't get a the same thing back. You get a bit. So you get something with type of bit. Let's see if that compiles. for this stuff here. Let's just uh, comment that out for a sec. Um, so let's try um, well, I guess you could try something up here. You could put in let's put it in here. Um, let's say out zero is output uh, is out zero. Um, okay, let's do it like this. Um, Okay. Just because I want to be able to see those internal things. Um, in one, in two, C in, C out, and then. We need that for now. 
pagar. Right, so let's make sure the type checking works. So if I do minus one, that should be out of bounds. If I do nine, that should be out of bounds. Actually, I guess eight even. Okay, so that means I'm, I'm not doing the check correctly. It should be strictly less than the bounds. Um, right. And also, if I try to use like a string as a subscript, that should also complain. Okay. Um, so that's it for index nodes. Let's do um, let's do slicing. See here. Let's print that to see what happens because I can never remember exactly what the structure of that stuff is. So if you do something like, um, gosh, I don't know. Um, so this is one thing. Okay, so that's zero, right? So it's start, end, and I think if you do this, it's equivalent to none, right? You get nones for those. Start, stop, step. And I'm guessing if I do like one, two, three, Oh, right, the construct. Yeah. Because they can't fit arbitrary contexts. Um, Okay.
right. Um, let's see here. If stop is less than Missing one required positional argument. No, oh, it should be super. Okay. Um. Now we should be able to do this. But if I do this, for example, that should not work. Of course, right now the the type errors are garbage. Um, let me actually fix that. Trigger that again. Okay. So that's the upper eight and the upper eight and um. This is a feature we also haven't added, but I think probably the last thing we're going to add before we stop the stream is doing these kind of partial connections. Um, and um, C and C out, and then the out is the upper out. And C out is the overall C out. So the thing that's oh actually I guess that will work because adder one has a class variable corresponding to that. So if I did something else like in one here, that should fail. Although this is not really correct because 
Um, yeah, that's something we have to fix. Um, the thing it's picking up here is the sort of the template, the template version of this node. Whereas what you really want is the instances version of that node. Um, because what you want to do, let's just see if I can finish that before we finish the session today. Basically, I don't want to, um, I actually don't want um, let's remove those. Um, What's the, I really don't want to use delete. That's the old school Python shit. Um, I mean, I can, but. Okay, yeah, let's let's do it. Anyway, the old, I guess the more canonical ways to do this, but I never liked the way the Dell syntax works in Python. It really um, feels like a relic. It's totally unnecessary. Anyway, um, all right, so all of these things that define the template are actually not going to be in the eventual class that's recreated. Uh, we capture them in this nodes uh, like they're all accessible through these new variables we create but they're not uh, nakedly available and that's intentional because the things that are going to be available somehow need to know about where they came from so if you refer to the cn pin from different instances of the same module template they should not be confused right so um I think what you do, in addition to this stuff, um, Yeah, so what, what I'm going to do is, uh, so there's no class level variables for all of those things. But then when you create the module instance, I'm going to fill in essentially attributes corresponding to the inputs and outputs. And those are going to be special nodes called module input node and module output node, uh, which unlike these things here are not kind of the prototypes, they're the, the real thing, they're like pins. Um, So this is maybe a little confusing with the naming. I'll think of better names potentially in the future. But the important thing is they know about where they came from, basically. They have some kind of back reference to uh, the module they came from. 
And so um, it's something like this, basically. Maybe even this. Subject of change, but let me just get this in before we finish off for today. Um, Um, and these are going to be represented differently um, as well, so that basically when we get the representation, it's going to be like something dot something else, and it's going to be uh, the module uh, You know, something like this, basically. Um, stir object has no attribute name. object oh right these were dictionaries Actually, that's fine. So we just we actually only need the keys for the specific case here. Oh no, sorry, that's not true. We do need that. Uh, no type name. No type name. So that type checks again, but now for, for better reasons, like uh, you can see here, if I print CN, um, it's, oh, so that's, <laughs> it's, it's almost right, um, module input node, problem is there's a built-in function called module, where it's foreshadowing, but I don't really care about that. Right, so exactly. So now you can see um, like this. So these are two different instances, or these are pins from two different instances of the same module template. So that's basically what we want here. And you can see here in the notation, uh, that's what it says. Now, um, actually, um,
Let's do the same thing here for modules. And so name in this case Um, I'm going to use the underscore because people are going to be dotting that thing, uh, like, you know, and you want to be able to define your own field called name, but I'm going to reserve these underscore names uh, for my purposes. So, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. So that's not filled in, but um, it's probably just a typo. So this is not getting executed. That is getting executed. This is not. Oh, that is. So I guess the problem oh the problem is it hasn't been assigned a name at this point um, that's correct but that's not really a deep issue okay that's it's fine Um, um, boom, 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 boom. Let's call it definitions rather than nodes. I think there should be a dictionary as well. Might as well make it that since it's ordered. So let's see what that has. Um, in one and two and three, and then we have all these in adder one. Okay, so let's uh, I guess let's do a wrapper here. And I think what we're going to do is. Um,
Let's see here. Um, boom, boom, boom. So we have to go over the connections, I suppose. Um, All right. So this looks pretty reasonable. You can see the pretty printing here is pretty accurate to form. You could, you know, and of course right now we're just hooking stuff up directly, but you could do weird stuff like suppose you wanted to negate this input. Uh, Actually, I guess we can't do that right now, but you could do something like this. Oh, there's a bug there. Um, I guess for constant mode. But yeah, anyway, so so far we, we mostly have what we have. We have some syntactic sugar in this embedded language, and we have type checking uh, and a couple of, of initial operators. Um, but the big thing is we have the starts of the module stuff. Um, and that's probably enough for today. Um, okay, I think that's enough for today. Um, yeah, next time, which will actually be tomorrow because yesterday's session was, well, this session was supposed to have been yesterday. And so we'll be on the same schedule as usual for the rest of the week, which means tomorrow we'll, we'll continue right where we left off. Um, aside from expanding the vocabulary of the operators, some of the stuff we'll want to do is actually, um, checking like some additional semantic checking for example an output node cannot like you know you cannot use inputs and outputs and vice versa sort of some some directionality on some of these node types uh, anyway that's it for next time and uh, along with uh, any other bug fixes or improvements i come across um, but i'm pretty happy with where this ended up for today so um, uh, see everyone next time